because we've got a field for air fibrillation. Previously, we didn't have a field for air fibrillation, so we've had to make some rules about that. But the bottom line is the number of repairs is going up year on year. Yeah, it's, it's not got my talk on, I'm afraid. Um, the, the mortality for isolated mitral valve repair is in general low and is in general coming down, but not in terms of a big effect. But the mortality rates for mitral valve replacement is high and is, is, is consistently high. So we're talking about uh, repair rates of about 3.5% for the young people and 5, 8, 9% for people as they get older uh, above, uh, above the age of 60, going up to the age of, uh, age of 80. So mitral valve replacement plus coronary artery surgery has got very high mortality rates. So when I look at this data, what I'm always trying to look at is the low-hanging fruits for quality improvement. And I think the repair rates... Uh, the mortality rates after repair are low and consistently low. The mortality repair rates after replacement are high and consistently high. The other window we have into our app is this uh, lookup table thing. And I don't know if people have seen that, but if you haven't seen that, what you can do is you can put in patient characteristics and find out how many of those cases there were and what their mortality rate was. So I've been through, I've spent ages going through the, uh, the, 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 the app to, to my talk to show how many patients fall in these different operative groups and what their mortality rates and anybody's interested can do, can do that themselves but again the mortality rates for mitral valve replacement and coronary artery surgery particularly remains high and what you can then do having seen that is you can say is that because it's emergencies is that because it's uh, infective endocarditis and you can take out those very high is that because it's people with previous MI so we've looked at all of those and take those out but those still remain very high too and I can forward this uh, the, the presentation so people can get, a, get an opportunity to see it the, so the bottom line on this, if people want to look up anything with respect to mitral valve activity or mitral valve outcomes, the tools now exist to enable you to do that. And I think that's useful in terms of a sort of a surgical epidemiology perspective. And the SCTSI data app is also useful in terms of making decisions for individual patients. So you can say, actually, if you happen to be uh, an octogenarian with poor left ventricular function, you are a very rare category of uh, patient. Similarly, the other thing that I was interested to check is the sort of proportion of risk factors we have, particularly for the mitral valve repair group. Um, we knew when we did some work a few years ago that a significant proportion, maybe 25% of everybody who has uh, a mitral valve repair, has got impaired left ventricular function by the time we do a mitral valve repair, and maybe 2 or 3% have got poor left ventricular function by the time we do mitral valve repair. So we are getting these people late in the disease, and what I've tried to do is to track that over time to see whether that's getting any better. And disappointingly, we know that's a problem. A lot of people have done a lot of work with their cardiologists to try and make that better, but it's not getting any better. We are still getting... Uh, the same proportion of these patients, which is about a quarter, who by that stage have got left ventricular function such that they're not going to get optimal uh, benef benefit from surgery. The final thing that I was going to show you was this uh, graph, which we've seen twice already today, which is the discrepancy in repair rates across different centres. I think when we did that uh, in 2009, uh, we showed that the repair rate on average was about 60%. Uh, but it ranged from very low levels to higher levels. In general, higher levels of repair rates in the bigger centre, but not exclusively so. We were criticised for that at that time because the data wasn't all right, and uh, uh, one of the points of putting the data out there was to try and force people to, 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 to make it all right. And I think people have worked quite hard on getting their data in better order since then, uh, and we've been feeding data back to people. What we haven't got at the moment is uh, an up-to-date analysis of, the, of that repair rate. We have looked overall for degenerative uh, mitral valve disease, and the repair rate's about 66% at the moment. So one in three people with degenerative valve disease are still not getting a, 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 a repair. But we have the ability to be able to uh, an analyse that data, to feed that data back by units. And indeed, that sort of data may be the data that people decide is the sort of data that needs to feed into uh, uh, the commissioning process. So the data is now in a stage where we've cleaned it up, we've put some windows into the data to get these headline figures coming back, and actually that data now exists, which is the sort of data which can inform decision making which comes out of the CIG. So that's, I apologise for not having the data, but those are the kind of things that I was going to show. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. So without the, um, without the slides, uh, uh, does anybody uh, have any questions for Ben? We've got time for two or three. Can I, can I ask something? In the database, do you categorize pathology as um, degenerative and ischemic, and do you have differential repair rates demonstrated for these categories? We do categorize. The, 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 what I say, do you? Does, does the data set differentiate between those different groups for etiology? Yes, they do. Is that completed 100% uh, uh, of the time? 
No, it's not. Is it uh, completed consistently? We don't really know. But indeed, we do have the ability. So when we're doing the, showing the stuff about degenerative uh, mitral valve repair, to feed into that group which then gets analysed, you have to be in the database, you have to have a mitral valve repair, you have to have not had anything else, and you need to have etiology needs to say degenerative, and that's the group that we start off with, and then we look at repair versus replacement rates in that, in that particular group. Frank. If you haven't heard of the back, surgeon-specific versus centre data. We now have surgeon-specific data. Why don't we go to that? Because if we want to really pull our shoestrings up, that's the way to do it, isn't it? Yeah, I think, I think that's probably right. I mean, so what do I try and do? I try and sit centrally and I try and analyse the data in, in a meaningful way which will make sense for people and hopefully that will drive quality improvement. And you try and put some messages out which will drive quality improvement. But actually, what can uh, we do centrally to, to drive quality improvement? All we can do is kind of raise the questions and provide data back to show that some of the questions are, are getting answered. In terms of how you deal with it locally, there's two ways of doing that. One is through the sort of approach locally where you suggest we want to do the right thing for patients, we want to have the highest possible repair rates, you will get the highest possible repair rates if you've got a clear subspecialisation sub, sub, sub agenda, we will manage to that, we will have the difficult conversations and we will sort it out. And some hospitals have been very successful in doing that, other hospitals have been less successful in doing that. But actually I think quality improvement has to start at the organisational level and people should be uh, encouraged to do that and supported in doing that and actually to some extent held to account for doing that but it has to be done locally. What more can we add to that centrally in terms of providing information back into the pot to demonstrate where that's not happening? We can do some stuff around that, but we haven't really pushed that particularly at the moment. How will professional revalidation change that? So if you are having an appraisal and you're doing mitral valve repair and you are doing 10 cases a year and you know over the last three years you've done 30 cases of which you've replaced a third of them and uh, you know, should some questions be asked about that in appraisal? Yes, they should. If you don't comply with that, should that have implications for you? In my view, yes, it should. But it requires quite sophisticated local management to do that. Yep. Yeah. should be. But the CRGs, the commissioning groups, could. And if you've got a unit where, say, one surgeon is doing a lot of very good work, but his work's being dragged down by those around him, not necessarily bad surgeons, but not specialising, uh, if that data was there for the CRG to look at, they could then put external pressure on the unit to sort itself out. Yeah, I, I think that's right. So the one thing I haven't talked about is this governance toolkit thing, which is another window that we have into the data which enables people to look at their risk-adjusted mortality rates on the previous uh, three months, year, three years, or whatever else. And we've put in a grant to try and develop that governance toolkit to put some other uh, measures in there. And one of the measures that we wanted to put in there was uh, degenerative repair rates for individuals and organisations. So we make that data much more visible to people in the hope that that will drive the, sort of ch the, the change that's required. Okay, one, one last question there. Just a, a comment and a question. Uh, I think as far as the categorization of etiology is concerned, I think there, there are probably lots of gray areas in there. And I think we would, benef we would benefit from having uh, guidance or definitions for those categories because from what I can tell, you, you base your uh, analysis on picking out the degenerative uh, section. The question is, um, is um, regarding uh, when you identify patients who've had mitral valve repair, am I right in thinking that you're only looking at isolated mitral valve repair? Because quite often the mitral repair is the predominant operation that you're doing, but you're also doing a graft here or, or, or an ablation there. And I think those patients should be included in your analysis. Yeah, no, you're right. Um, it's, it, that's a really difficult one because... Um, it's one of these things which sounds quite easy to do and actually is, is very difficult to do when you start to sit down. So what, when you know that some people, say you've got AF, uh, say you've had paroxysmal AF uh, and you've been previously... Say it quick then. Yeah, okay. Got, so people do different things. Some people do F ablation, some people don't. Some people try cuspid rings, some people don't. And all those kind of things. So actually having a clear crystal definition of these different operative groups is, is surprisingly difficult. So we've taken the approach at the moment to benchmark isolated mitral valve repair and isolated mitral plus cabbage repair. We could do it in a different way, but there's, there's problems with that. Oh, thank you.
Yes, unfortunately, there's a sort of knock-on delay that's happened, as, as we all know, and then there was the IT problem. So I think what we all feel is that after each talk, there'll be one or two questions, given that the discussion period at the end might not take place. In that regard, um, Simon Ray was, uh, told us this morning, for those of you who weren't here, about a very interesting clinical study that's uh, taking place in assessing surgery versus uh, medical management of asymptomatic mitral valve uh, repair candidates, but um, today I think, si well now Simon's going to tell us about a sort of cardiological p perspective of commissioning going forward. Obviously this will mainly pertain to the UK, but uh, we'll be hearing the American perspective later from David Adams. 